My name is Josh Marcus. Um, I'm a software developer at Meetup. I work in um, data analytics. Um, and talk, the name of the talk is Understanding the World Pixel by Pixel. Um, so uh, it's awesome to be talking about this because it's something I've talked about in the open source mapping technology world, but not in the Scala world. So um, it's really cool to, to share this. Um, and uh, I'll give you all sort of a, a brief taste of what this domain is about, and hopefully it'll be a fun change of pace. Um, uh, so GeoTrellis is a Scala library for uh, fast distributed process and analysis of geographic raster data. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, when I say it's fast, it's designed to be low latency so that um, you can see the results of analysis you want to do um, in real time, in web time, and we use this to build um, both like interactive web services as well as um, uh, sort of more batch processing projects that um, have a time component. Um, and efficiency has been a big piece of this project. Um, distributed in that we uh, define sort of a data pipeline and uh, GeoTrellis will automatically either parallelize that or let you distribute it over machines. Um, uh, processing and analysis, and that there's a set of techniques used in uh, geographic information systems to transform raster data, that a number of which are implemented in GeoTrellis. Um, so uh, just to give you a, a bit of background, um, uh, Eric and I, um, Eric who's here, um, a lot of you know, um, started this project in 2000, uh, no, 2000, uh, 2010. Um, uh, at a software development company called Azavia in Philadelphia, which um, pushes the state of the art in uh, geographic information systems. It was open sourced in uh, 2012. Um, uh, Rob, who is also here, and Eugene not showed this here as well, Rob is now currently the tech lead of this project, and uh, GeoTrellis is soon to be um, an, a project under the Eclipse Foundation, which is really cool, um, in a, uh, um, a subgroup called Location Tech. So that's Kind of exciting. Um, but so let's just talk about like what is raster data and why am I excited about it? Because um, you probably aren't. Um, so the, uh, the story uh, begins with this elegant and humble creature um, who you may or may not recognize. Um, in its natural habitat, we recognize it as the pixel. Um, Pixel's not very exciting by itself, but what we can do with it is really pretty exciting. Um, we can color it in. That's not that exciting. Um, we can make pretty pictures with it. And that's often what we think of when we think of the pixel um, in that, uh, <laughs> the picture, um, in that, uh, right, images are in fact, um, uh, you know, made up of pixels. But what's really exciting is when uh, we put numbers in it. Um, if we have a grid, all of a sudden now we have a Sudoku. Um, but, oh, but here we have the raster. So with the raster, we have a grid, right, um, a regular grid, and we pin it onto the map. We sort of define, you know, how many cells, how many columns, and where on a particular map. So by a map, we, sort of, we have the Earth, the world is, is round, but maps are flat. And, and so we project it. And so we say, OK, great. On this map, where is the leftmost uh, side of the, or the, you know, the westmost side of this grid? What's the eastmost side? And each of these cells now represents an actual place on the Earth. And we can put some information in it that tells us something about it. Um, now, of course, this is very, the resolution here isn't really very good. Um, this, oh, what we're looking at here is the um, National Elevation Database, um, NED. And so this is a raster. The grid is about like 2 million by 1 million. Um, and it's about uh, 6 terabytes. Um, and so uh, it's interesting because it's not necessarily big data, right? But it's not small either, and it's not fast, right? And certainly when you're working with a number of them, there's some real challenges. Um, what's really exciting about the raster is it gives us a way to describe the entire world, right? And there aren't that many tools that we have to do this, right? We can model the world. We can predict what's happening. Um, and there's a whole kind of wide range of phenomena that we can use to do this. Um, and so what else can we actually use to do this? And the answer is, well, Sure, if we're talking about place, we do have points, lines, and polygons. Um, but when we're talking about a continuous surface, so say like temperature, everywhere on the Earth has a temperature, raster is a really good way to go. Um, uh, 
Also, we can often take points and lines and polygons and interpolate them um, into raster data, right? So you have weather balloons that have, give you, say, temperature, and then you can sort of guess or use different methods to decide what the values around that is. Um, we also, it's not just about the weather, our natural phenomenon, though this is like popular for science. Um, so, for example, our, our humble uh, pixel can represent, you know, educational outcomes. We can ask questions around um, economic inequality. You know, what is the average income in an area, right? Um, we can, the traveler, we can model travel time, like how, how far would it take us to travel from this place? Um, uh, land use is a popular thing. Um, you know, is a certain part of the earth used for, is it residential, is it industrial, right? Um, and there's all kinds of raster data made available by, you know, from satellites, from space. Um, also, uh, the uh, US government puts out all kinds of raster data. We can also build it. Um, so, uh, right, so when I started, we were looking at, oh. Mm -hmm. Great. So this guy, right, so this is just, um, <coughs> right, what we, in the background is, um, sorry, my computer's unhappy with me. Um, what we have here in the background is uh, uh, a beautiful data set called um, Black Marble or Earth at Night. It is a composite of shots taken by NASA um, uh, in, on, on cloudless nights. Um, and what we see beneath it are, at, that's actually like the light of a city or populated areas. And so it's cool because it's actually a cool proxy for where population is. Because um, right when we zoom out, right, we might, you know, we see like, you know, people don't live uh, evenly distributed throughout the country. Um, and then what's being overlaid here is an image that we're generating using GeoTrellis from a, a, like a live stream of RSVPs. Um, so let's take a look at that a little bit further. Oh, sorry. So this is um, meetup. this is Meetup. So at Meetup, basically, people can schedule events and invite people to come. And an RSVP is when someone says, "Hey, I'm going to come," right? Um, and so it's this is sort of just a proxy for you know where wh who's using it. Um, so here is. Um, um, uh, um, here, here's some code. This is, this is not necessarily the best example code, um, and I'll look at some simpler examples. Um, but the basic idea is that um, there's an operation called kernel density, where we take a point and we spread out its sort of its influence um, over a broader area. Um, and we can define sort of the so and, and the kernel density, really what we're doing is we're stamping a smaller rat grid on a bigger grid, and we can define the size of it and its spread. Um, uh, one thing, to, so here, we're basically, we start here, we define this kernel density, this gives us a raster. Um, there are these two maps here. Um, the first one is because um, in GeoTrellis, when we're constructing these operations, um, uh, we're, not, we're not doing the work right here, right? This is, it's sort of like a, a, a future or a task, right? It, it has yet to be done. So the first map is simply to say, to bring us into the context of the result once we get it. And then what we've gotten is actually a raster and this map, so it's a little confusing, is, um, is treating the raster just like it's an array or a list, right? And then I'm saying, hey, um, for every value in, this ra in the raster we will later get, um, if, it's, if the value is no data, um, then set it to zero, just because that is necessary for what I, wanna, what I want to do later. Then I add, <clears throat> so we're basically we're doing a fold over um, the, uh, like, uh, we have a stream of new points coming in, and then what we're doing is we're, we're making a new, a new raster with the new points, and we're combining it to the raster we used to have. Um, I'm multiplying the, the old raster by 0 0.9 to sort of cause that fadeaway effect, and then uh, calling cached. Um, so there's a lot to it, but um, I'll keep going. Um, let me just show you also this GeoTrellis Transit, because it's kind of also a neat thing that um, we have done with this. So in GeoTrellis Transit, um, you know, can you see that? Um, right, so no. oh, let me change this to something you can actually see. Um, right, so this is where I live in Philadelphia, right? And what this, uh, this is like an open source thing. You can play with it, mess with it. You can load your own data for your own area into it um, if you set it up. Um, and the idea here is that as I move this bar, 
it shows me how far I could travel from that location um, if, uh, you know, get at 3.41 p.m. on a weekday, um, and then I've, I've selected like regional rail, regional rail, bus and subway, and walking. And the, the reason this is possible is that we're generating on the back end this grid where each cell says how, you know, how long would it take me to get there, right? Um, so kind of awesome. And we can, you know, move it around and do all kinds of stuff. Um, there's a sort of, there's like another interesting use of it where um, this is like a scenic view, which is like, I want to leave here and arrive here. Um, and I'm willing to take uh, a certain amount of time. How long could I stay in between points by calculating how long does it take me to arrive at places, which is like one raster layer. Another layer is how long does it take me to arrive at a second place and actually subtracting the one value from the other value. Um, right, so I mean, the, the basic idea, I mean, raster data in the end is quite simple, but there are, there's sort of like a whole world of techniques designed um, to help us work with it. Um, doo -doo -doo. There's an interview. Um, there is a thing called map algebra, which is um, a sort of a formalism for manipulating raster data. Um, there's a professor called Dana Tomlin who um, has been an advisor to us on this project, who's been great. Um, but like, you know, the idea here is like, here we have one raster that re represents fire hazards, another one that represents flood hazards. We just add them together, and now we have something that represents um, risk. Um, uh, I'm going to skip through all sorts of stuff. Um, just to mention, um, here is a, like a simpler version of, uh, of an operation where basically we have a bunch of layers. We're going to multiply every value in those layers um, to weight them and then add them together um, with that reduced, and then we render them as a graphic. And there's a color ramp that sort of defines, it will look at the values in the raster, divide them up into classes, and then color it. Um, one thing I thought would be worth mentioning here is uh, earlier, um, Heather, you were talking about um, type level computation and type classes and how they can be useful. And I thought it'd be cool just to highlight this as a practical example. Um, so right in that pipeline, we have a thing called like a data source. And it, it's sort of like, if you're familiar with things like Spark, it's like a distributed data source. We don't know where, if the data is on our machine or somewhere else, but, um, and there's a raster data source, and it has all these methods of transformation methods that we can use. Um, uh, it is useful, right, so this is ugly, um, but we have a, a map function that allows us to, when we're writing these construction methods, to transform some a, a data source to some other data source, right? And what ends up being really useful is that we can say, what, what, you know, in the end, what the, what the this type class instances let us do is they basically have a, a lookup table that says, hey, if you are working with a raster source and what you end up with is histograms, then this is the kind of data source I would like you to end up with. Um, and the nice thing about uh, this whole, the whole can build from pattern is it lets us automatically, or not automatically, but lets us pass along necessary metadata about like where does it, where do these data sets exist in space to pass that forward, which is really useful and allows us to avoid a lot of duplicated code. And so this part of the machinery is, is messy, but it leads to a very clean API. Um, I am about out of time. Um, uh, one thing that's fun about our uh, parallelization is that um, it is not um, tr uh, what they call trivial parallelization, and that often data sets actually rely on each other, which is complicated. Um, one thing just worth mentioning um, is that we, you know, what we do all day, every day is deal with large arrays of numbers. And so Scala has been amazing for you know, API construction. And you can, and uh, I'd like to highlight uh, Eric's premature optimization uh, talk from last year, um, because you can write really fast Scala code. It just, you know, might take off some months of your life or years. Um, and, <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I just encourage everyone to do whatever it is you have to do to make your code fast on the inside, you know, um, and then, you know, and, ha and allow your code to have um, beautiful functional interfaces on the outside. Um, and uh, beware specialization, it doesn't work. <laughs>